Okay, yes, okay. Okay, let's go. And don't want to show us. No, no, okay, thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Evening, everyone. Um, a really warm welcome to everyone here this evening. It's great to see such an amazing turnout, um, both here in Edinburgh, um, and we've got over 100 people listening in online, and they're from all over Scotland. Um, they're tuning into our live stream, so they'll be able to hear all we're saying and then all the comments, which will be, hopefully, you'll be engaged um, and want to, to comment on what we're talking about tonight. Um, so we've got people from um, Noidart and Egg and Sky and Cairngorms, um, Central Belt, um, and we've got Bria's Click Community Association have opened up the village hall so all the community can come, so that's brilliant. Um, now this is the first in Community Land Scotland's lecture series in memory of Simon Fraser. Simon was a hugely important figure in the community ownership and land reform movement. I never had the personal pleasure of meeting Simon, but there are many, many people here this evening, his family and his friends and work colleagues, who will be sharing stories about this larger-than-life character and the contribution he made to the issues that we all care very deeply about. And the lecture series is part of Community Land Scotland's major new project, 100 Years of Community Ownership. This is a project sponsored by the Heritage Lottery Fund and Scottish Government, and it's going to create a living archive of community ownership, which is one of the most important political, economic, and social movements in Scotland in the last 100 years. And it's designed to celebrate the work of all the communities who have pioneered these achievements, many of whom are here tonight, and also to provide very valuable resources to support new and would-be community ownership groups to be inspired to start their own journey. It's also going to help um, explore how community ownership has transformed those communities and how it's transformed Scotland and how it could shape the future internationally. So the project will involve an oral history and archive training program, and we're just about to start going out on the road on that in February, and that's going to provide the skills for all participants to contribute to a new website that shares individual community stories and builds a collective legacy for all of Scotland's community owners. So the overall project includes the Simon Fraser Lecture Series, a touring exhibition, and pop-up events across the country. And you can find details about the whole project on the Community Land Scotland website. So tonight's Simon Fraser inaugural memorial lecture um, uh, is launches a program of seven events that will take, part, um, t take place as part of the 100 Years of Community Ownership. And these events will be hosted by the Isle of Egg Heritage Trust, the Isle of Gear Heritage Trust, Golson Estate Trust, Staffin Community Trust, and the Community Land Trust Network down in London. So we're taking the story down to London too. And the plan is to then hold an annual Simon Fraser Memorial Lecture in different locations around Scotland to provide an annual platform to discuss and celebrate the issues so close to Simon's heart, land reform, community empowerment, and the cultural importance of land. These continue to be urgent topics for all of Scotland, and we plan to use this annual event to invite expert speakers and cultural figures to contribute to the ongoing debate. But land reform, community wealth building, and how our land is used to address the pressing ecological and social issues we face is going to be crucial to the well-being of Scotland in the years ahead. And we look forward to the lecture series, the Simon Fraser Memorial Lecture Series, being a key contribution to that discussion. The event this evening and the inaugural lecture is sponsored by Anderson MacArthur, solicitors with a particular specialism in property matters for which Simon completed his legal apprenticeship in the early 1980s and remained a solicitor, partner and latterly director in the firm until his passing in 2016. And we're really pleased to be joined this evening by colleagues who worked with and trained under Simon over the years, including his sister-in-law, Sina MacLeod, who was his secretary for over 20 years through many of the important buyouts. Um, now, I don't have any housekeeping instructions for you tonight from the um, venue, but only if you hear the alarm, it's real. Um, it's not a drill. Um, and to sit in your seats, wait for the fire marshal to come. Um, so finally, it gives me really great pleasure to hand over to a wonderful panel of speakers tonight, some of them very glittery and sparkly, um, <laughs> who are going to be entertaining and inspiring us this evening. Um, I know Maggie and Agnes well and know what great value for money they are, um, but I'm really looking forward to Anne and Corrine's contributions to the evening, which would be, I think, a really wonderful way of celebrating Simon's life. 
and also looking forward and celebrating Scotland and its people and communities, causes which I think are close to all our hearts. Now, um, you'll be pleased to know this is the last you'll be hearing from me this evening, um, and I know Agnes will have a long list of people to thank at the end of the event, um, but I also wanted to add my thanks to our wonderful speakers um, this evening and to the amazing team we have at Community Land Scotland. Um, who've organised this event tonight. And special thanks to Meg, who's always wandering around at the back, um, Lindsay, Josh and Gavin, and the rest of the team who never fail to impress um, with their good humour, ingenuity and commitment, um, even in the face of two named storms in two days. Still didn't <laughs> phase them at all. So many thanks. Um, so I'm going to pass over to our amazing vice chair, Agnes Rennie from Golson. Um, she was quite rude about me last night, so I said I was going to get my own back, but <laughs> I'm far too well mannered. Um, so she won't appreciate me saying this, but she really is the, the stalwart and the backbone of our organisation um, and the very best person to highlight the wonderful achievements both of Simon and of our members and our contributors. Thank you. Over to Agnes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Elsa. Well, uh, I'm here for your faith in the looting you have to show no. I guess have some good coyu, a harsh to your colors, my age, a year, now stay show a kumat von hoi, a fagant eel. I guess I should hear me and for your sikin, she going toward my gain. De short thing you have show Simon Fraser, Mammy Dane Brien, hast the Blion Hamore for Gakashi. As we shun ye, Hamisha Color Elsa, Kumat the Dirt, is in Horak of Yakamanok, Colorishing in Yakolor. Can I just add my welcome to Elsa, uh, to you all for coming here tonight? It's fantastic to see such a tremendous gathering. And uh, as Elsa said, we know that there are at least as many as there are in this room, if not twice as many, indeed, uh, joining us online from all over the world. And that is surely testament to the man in whose name uh, this event tonight is named, and that's Simon Fraser. So um, when I was looking at how we would do this tonight, there was no way that we were going to get into kind of standing on the floor and giving, giving speeches. I think we all agreed very early on that was not what we were going to do, um, that we were going to have a conversation and some songs. Fortunately, we have Karin with us, who will provide that part of the evening. Um, and we'll have a bit of reminiscing, but we'll also have some looking ahead because this community land movement is not something that stands still, but it's absolutely vital that in not standing still, we have an awareness of what has gone before. I'm reading a book at the moment, which um, is a fantastic book, um, which is looking at conversations with the indigenous people of Australia. And when you talk about indigenous people, almost anywhere in the world, you can find common links. And one phrase really jumped out at me because the title of this book is Songlines. And it's, you'll all have heard about the songlines that are followed by the indigenous people, which they use instead of the maps that we use to trace and track and keep their relationship with the land. And this phrase goes, when you look behind you, you see the future in your footsteps. What a beautiful phrase that is. And the more you think about it, the more it actually makes you think. So tonight, we are going to look behind us at our footprints, and we're gonna use that to think about maybe what's next in this amazing community land movement. A little bit more information about Simon first, because I am very conscious that we have some very young people in this room tonight, and I'm sure we have some young people joining in. And even for us in Golson, far less you people in age, <laughs> Maggie, um, we now have a generation of young people who have grown up knowing nothing else but community land ownership in the community that I live in. And I still sometimes have to pinch myself to, rem to remind myself that that is in fact the case. And so, Simon, and Anne will keep me right if I get any of these points wrong. 
Simon was born in Glasgow in 1955, and while he was still a teenager, the family moved to Lewis. Now, that was clearly a huge, important step in their lives. Simon's Fraser, Simon Fraser was the son of Alistair Fraser, who was, in fact, a teacher in the Nicholson Institute, where I and many others, some of them in this room even tonight, uh, had uh, Alistair as a teacher. And Simon then went on, again, like many of the rest of us in the islands, to uh, be a student at Aberdeen University, eventually graduating in 1976, but not graduating in law. He graduated in an arts degree, and then came back to Lewis, and very quickly, I think his work first job, I'm right in saying, Anne, was with Anderson MacArthur, working alongside the then senior partner, Douglas Kesting, and Simon very, very quickly became a very integral part of that team, started a law apprenticeship, that was his route to law, and in, let me get this right, 1981, he then eventually completed his apprenticeship. 1989 was then a really important year, because that was the year that the then government decided to look at the possibility of offering land that was held by the Scottish government in Skye and Rasi for transferring to the community. And Simon was invited to bring his legal brain to that team um, that was looking at how this could be done. Because whatever people say about the law, crafting law is in a class of its own. <laughs> and I really wish that, um, I know we have Malcolm in here tonight, Malcolm Kuhn, sorry for, sorry for yeah, that, hands up, Malcolm. Only one or two people in this world are actually experts on crafting law, and uh, unfortunately, Maggie Mackay, another of them, was only able to join us online tonight because she wasn't able to get her flight from Lewis. So she'll probably be kind of saying something about me just now for name-checking her too. <laughs> but fortunately, we have people like that still who do understand crafting law. Unfortunately, the transferring of the DAFS estates, as they were and are still known, although DAFS is long gone, um, it didn't happen. But the work that Simon did then came into play again in 1992 when the Ascent Crofters Trust started its journey. And I think the transferring, the, the, the purchase indeed, of the land in an open market situation to the Ascent Crofters Trust was a huge milestone. And indeed, it's the milestone that probably for all of us here uh, was the, the marker Definitely. that led us to what is now the modern land, community land uh, movement. And from that time on, it's fair to say that Simon was very, very involved in all the big ones. And that's all I'm going to say because there are people here <laughs> on both sides of me who were far more involved and know far, far more about these things than I do. It's important to know too though that Simon wasn't just involved in the legal world. He was also very involved in what was then Scottish Natural Heritage. Indeed was the chair of Northwest Board and put in a long number of years in that role. And I think it's fair to say that because, not because he was a lawyer, undoubtedly with that knowledge behind him, but specifically because he was a crofter. He was enabled to engage with crofters and crofting communities like our own and start to bridge a wide gulf that at that time existed between crofting and the environment movement, although they were both very interdependent. So, Again, what's happened since and the many initiatives that have been taken and what we now know as Nature Scott, the relationship that exists within many of our communities, I'm quite sure that Simon had a big, heart, big hand in the creation of that. Near her home, he was very involved in the setting up of the Callanish Trust. You've all heard of the Callanish Stones. With the setting up of Uras and Toshochen, for the first time there was a there was, an, uh, I guess, a structure in place locally uh, which was able to look at the possibility 
of actually creating something that would bring some jobs and opportunity to the community. There are so many other things I could talk about, but I'm not going to talk about them now. I am going to, first of all, go to Anne. And Anne Fraser, right here beside me, uh, lived through all of this and probably listened to all of this, <laughs> Anne. <laughs> <laughs> probably knew the stories and um, knew the times that Simon came home with a sore head, uh, sh scratching his head. Yes. Um, where do we start, Anne? What would you say yourself was, was the most, you know, was Egg, was Egg the first, the first no, Asant no, was I the first one. Mm -hmm. Did you visit yes. Asant with him? Uh, yes, we did. Uh, and that was such a keely, and that was <laughs> quite a keely in um, Loch Ender. It was good. <laughs> the, uh, good evening to you all, and it's a, a real privilege to be here tonight um, at this inauguration ceremony. And I know that Simon would be totally honoured and humbled, you know, by this event tonight. Uh, I'm going to talk about Simon, the, the family man, and maybe memories of him working on the um, community bias mm -hmm, work. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll start off with when we got married, uh, the 1st of August, 1980. And it's a double wedding ceremony with my sister, Mary, and her husband, Rory. And I remember one of the telegrams back in the day when we received telegrams at weddings. It was from the midwifery team at the Lewis Hospital where I worked as a midwife at the time. And it read, with a first class meal, we expect an early delivery. <laughs> well, <laughs> and was well, it? Nah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, we were blessed with four of a family, two boys and two girls. And it's good that three of the family managed here tonight. And Cara, unfortunately, uh, her fl flight was cancelled, but along with Maggie Matthias this morning. But it's, I'm delighted too that three of his first cousins are here tonight. What is it? Two or three or four. Paul, Dermot, Tristan, and um, of course, the, it's great that you all managed uh, to be here too. And we, we set, Simon and I set up home in the village of Callanish, and it's on the west side of Lewis. And of course, uh, being a crofter, we had cattle, sheep, hens. And I remember when, um, when his fellow solicitor colleagues in Stormy would maybe be playing golf or bridge um, in their spare time, Simon would be busy mucking out the barn or uh, milking the cow <laughs> or um, doing some croft maintenance work. But he uh, had a good croft. He, yeah. Well, that's it. You know, he, he, he was, was a, a, a croft at heart, yeah, and yeah. Uh, that's what he had to do. It's when in the mornings we need to be uh, out checking the cattle before going to work, then having to change into the suit and tie to go to the office. And uh, then I remember my father, he lived in the village nearby and he would be up visiting almost every day and um, saying things. Now, Anne, did Simon get his breakfast this morning? <laughs> you know, make <laughs> sure that we, we used to say to him. Well, that man deserves a good breakfast. You know, he was uh, quite concerned, you know, that um, Simon was, that, that he, he was being well looked after. So, because they got on extremely well, um, himself and his father-in-law. But of course, he got on with everyone. Um, and I remember, you know, when he took over the reins uh, as a state factor from his predecessor, as we mentioned, Douglas Kesty. And, oh, he loved, he loved getting out of the office uh, for the day, going out to these places. Um, but he wasn't Paris your Hollywood. average factor, let's be honest. Well, <laughs> I'm not sure. I can never, probably uh, not, uh, probably different to his predecessor, <laughs> right enough, Douglas <laughs> Kesty. Um, but uh, he, he just loved, li you know, getting to know the crofters in all these areas and usually on first name terms. And, being a Gaelic speaker himself um, was a, a real advantage uh, then because a lot of these crofters were uh, elderly and they could express themselves much better in their native language of Gaelic. 
and um, he, as I say, he, he just loved going to uh, Harris, well, Harris and I think as far as um, Burnery, in, uh, down to, well, Burnery is part of Harris, but to us it seems like Buist, Burnery <laughs> to us, but uh, he really, really enjoyed that, and uh, that time, and of course, as you mentioned, Agnes, he was involved locally in setting up the Uris Nutushev and the Kavanish Stones Trust alongside, and I'd like to mention the names of Brian Barrett and uh, this um, gentleman, Calumian MacLeod, uh, who later claimed to become a, a church minister. And I remember at the time, the, the Kavanish farm and the surrounding area there, which was quite a large area, the art, we call it in Gaelic, so I, I suppose it's obviously the, the kind of the high piece of um, ground. It was owned by Edinburgh University's archaeology department, and that was headed by uh, Professor Dennis Hardy. And I just remember, you know, the many some occasion, um, himself, uh, Dennis and a uh, archaeology friend, colleagues, uh, um, Chris Burgess and Neveka and um, Gerard, this uh, archaeologist from Wales, they would be down visiting and oh, he was just, many a discussion, you know, was had over tea, coffee and a good few drums <laughs> over, um, as he was, he had a, a, a real keen interest in archaeology himself, Simon. But it's Please also, I think, fair to say, isn't it, Anne, that he recognised that there was potential there to make it something yes, for the yes. community. Oh, it's definitely. Be because up till then, mm -hmm. it was just a place that, I shouldn't say just a place, but it was a place that mm -hmm. uh, archaeologists came and went from yes. and people and visited, yes, but yes, never, never really left anything behind as far as the community was concerned. Fantastic. And I, you're right, and the, the a few years later, when, when they finished doing their various digging, around uh, the, the Stones area and, uh, you know, the, the Edinburgh University uh, Archaeology Department, they kindly uh, gifted the Cavanish farmhouse on that whole area of land to the people of Cavanish. So I thought was, it uh, was quite generous, mm. you know, of them to do that, yes. Um, Could you say maybe maybe a wee bit now about, uh, you know, once once Asant got on the oh, yes, and you uh -huh. kind of yes. what, what, the, how, what was that was like from where you were standing? Oh, yes. oh my goodness, when the Asant went and I, the names, it's amazing, all these people became household names, just Alan McRae, Bill Ritchie, John McKenzie, Asant Croftish, um, oh, when they came to Simon asking uh, for his advice on how to proceed with buying their, their estate, oh, you know, um, he was really delighted. You know, but oh, what I remember about it, oh, he was working so much, you know, day and night into the early hours of the morning. And of course, between the visits to Ascent, back and forth from Ascent. And, but he had the belief, oh, he was just so sure um, in what he was doing, the belief, the commitment, uh, the dedication in what he was doing. and that, you know, this could be achieved. And it's amazing, but at the time, I, myself, I just had this assurance that he was going to be successful. It's amazing, I just, um, at the time, I, I knew that, um, believed that, he that could he do it. I believed he, he could do it. I wonder and if I could, if I could maybe turn to Maggie now, uh, and because I think that takes us nicely up to, mm -hmm. to Egg. Because you guys in Egg, maybe just paint a wee picture for us, Maggie, as to what Egg was like while all this was going on in Ascent, and why you guys saw this guy, Simon Fraser, and went for him. <laughs> <laughs> Little did we know. Little did we know. <laughs> I think, um, I mean, we were all aware of Ascent on Egg. Um, and highly delighted when that finally worked out. But Egg at that time, what, what year was Ascent? 92. 92. Well, I mean, yeah. Egg at that time was in pretty dire straits. Mm -hmm. Small, small population, 60 odd folk. Uh, an awful lot of folk didn't have any sort of security of tenure. 
um, our landlord at the time, Schellenberg, wouldn't wouldn't give people leases. So there were farms, there were businesses, there were houses, and none. Of, you know, you are not going to invest in the future of your house business um, without a lease, and you certainly can't get funding without security. So it was it was pretty dark. Not a lot of people working, not a lot of jobs. People have been made redundant from your farming estates. So yeah, it was, it was you know low low ebb really. Had been for quite a while by then mm -hmm. actually. Um, but so did you see what was happening in in Athens and start to think? Absolutely. I mean, this could be an answer. Th there'd been a few of us that had talked about it, but it wasn't. Um, you know, we hadn't got community backing. I mean, they probably just thought we were we were sort of mm -hmm. you know <laughs> slightly just <up>. Maggie again, <laughs> <laughs> them old hippies again. <laughs> <laughs> but um, you know, it gained ground. I mean, people would see that you know having having power over, over what you did yourself had had a lot to an awful lot to answer for. And it, it's funny. Uh, I was asking I was asking Colin. In fact, can I, could I remember? Could he remember when Harry Wicker got in contact with Colin? And with with Simon, with, with Simon, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and I think, you know, if you if you're going back then, there wasn't any of the organisations or bodies that there are now um, that can help communities um, to to get somewhere. There was nothing at all. But somehow, I can't I just can't quite remember how we got a small piece of funding from somewhere, and that funding meant that we could ask Simon to help us. Uh, Graham Scott and Steve Westwood, I think, were. You know, we, it was legal advice and it was business plan accountancy, and, and that's where we started. You know, that was the beginning of the of what turned out to be a, a great friendship. In fact, <laughs> and can you remember the first time <coughs> Simon came to Egg? Yeah, I think um, we had a lots, and uh, you can imagine the amount of community meetings we were having at that point. Um, but there was a whole group of people. Some of the guys from Athens came. Mm -hmm. um, Bill Ritchie, in, in particular, uh, was, but I think before that we'd met. There was an organisation called Hammers and Irons Forum. Yes. Anybody remember that yes. one? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> and that's when we first started meeting people like Alan McRae and Bill Ritchie. And that was kind of it, it was a lot for us. It was a lot to do with confidence and a lack mm -hmm. of confidence. You know, can we really do this? Is this really a, something that we can achieve? Um, and meeting those guys, and then, uh, yeah, that, that's how it kind of followed on. But Simon was amazing from the very beginning. You know, he just, he, he instilled confidence in you. And, um, and am I allowed to now tell my little story about... Um, uh, <laughs> it's entirely your opportunity, Maggie. <laughs> um, it's your story. Oh, uh, well, yeah, it's kind of good and bad, really. But anyway... Um, we, we all went to a Cayley on a neighbouring island of Muck. And back in the day, you would stay up all night, you would get a boat back in the morning, um, and we did, we did exactly that. And um, I'll be careful what I say because there's a garden journalist here, but there's a garden journalist <laughs> with us at this Cayley, came back to Egg, and as one sometimes does, the fun carried on. We carried on partying, we had musicians with us, um, et cetera, et cetera. Unbeknownst to me, I didn't notice him, but this journalist walked past on the road and um, he wrote, it, the, the article itself wasn't a bad article, it was criticising, it was criticising land ownership um, in Scotland, but unfortunately he, he told me later that London loves a mad jock story. <laughs> so <laughs> at the end of this article he wrote, Fife was last seen at the side of the road with a can of beer at her head. <laughs> this is Fife, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> okay. and obviously, you know, at that point in time, we were trying to gain credibility. <laughs> <laughs> so I was absolutely mortified, and I can remember being at the next meeting, and Simon was quite kind to me. <laughs> <laughs> but the point of this story is, a couple of weeks later, I got a phone call one day, and this woman said that she'd read the article in The Guardian. And at that point, I found myself slithering down in my seat. I'm still being mortified. Anyway, she said, I'd like to donate 500 
And I thought, in my world, she meant £500, <laughs> but she actually meant £500,000 um, because she believed in, in community land ownership and, and communities having the power to, to, to organise their own lives. So that's a kind of a, that's a way aside that you, you know, don't deny who you are and make sure that you have fun along the way. <laughs> because, uh, you know. <laughs> um, anyway, that's kind of cutting the story short, really. But, I mean, endless meetings. Simon was there at every one. He was always there at the end of a telephone, and I must have driven him crazy, phoning him every two minutes with all my panics and misers. Um, but Simon came up with, a, with the structure for the Aladdin Heritage Trust. Um, the structure was important because we probably didn't just have that confidence totally, but also because we'd had a long, a long relationship with the Highland Council. Our councillor at the time is here tonight, Michael, um, who was a lot involved in the whole thing. The Land and Environment Committee of the council had, had, had um, agreed to support any community buyouts that were might be on the door. We'd also had a long relationship with the Scottish Wildlife Trust, who'd had um, who managed the triple SIs on the island, had had a ranger on the island. And we like that. We like that kind of involvement from other. And we also agreed that we would have an independent chair. People felt that that was important to have somebody independent um, just to keep us all on the right track. <laughs> um, so, yeah, um, first attempt at buying eggs. Uh, we, we, we put a bid in. 1.2 million was the first attempt. That was all the money we had. Um, and it was based on the valuation, independent valuation. Um, they chucked that out. They didn't, didn't get to 2 million was, was what was being asked for. Um, so we carried on raising money. And then the, it was a bit of a stroke of luck, really, because the... Um, I missed out Maruma. The two years of Maruma, the German artist who visited Egg twice for two days each time, <coughs> didn't reply to anything we ever sent him, asking about leases and all the rest of it. That, that kind of convinced everybody that community ownership was the right thing. Um, his creditor, he, he borrowed money, a relatively small amount of money from a Hong Kong businessman and default, uh, used Egg as security and defaulted on that loan. Um, and that was when we jumped in, offered 1.5 million. We decided we weren't going to go any higher than that because that's what Maruma had paid for it and had done absolute bagger all while he owned egg. So, um, and that did the trick, 1.5 million. Uh, 4th of April, 97 was a big day. Um, and the, the entry date was the 12th of June, 97. Yes, which Anne was there oh. and <laughs> will remember. Yeah. Um, but Simon, Simon became our chair. He was the first chairperson. Um, and he did that for seven years. And, and that's probably the most important part of the whole thing. Obviously, the legal side of things is important. But <clears throat> Simon guided us through those first few years. I mean, you know, none of us, I mean, we had the commitment and we had the energy then. <laughs> Um, but we didn't really, you know, we didn't have any business en expertise. We, we, but Simon guided us through that, really. I mean, I think he was the, you know, he was the one who, who uh, made a huge difference. You know, he, he we, there'd not been much funding from High, for instance, put into Egg because of the lack of leases. And that was the first thing he did was um, High had suggested business units, and Simon suggested that those business units should be in one building. And we knew from all the workshops we'd done what thought felt was most important <coughs> was a new shop, a new tea room. Um, and that's what we did. We put, up <coughs> we put up that building and opened it on the... There's lovely photographs of Simon that day opening, opening Anne Lamerick, um, uh, which made a huge difference to Egg. And, and all that's gone on since then. Has yeah, 26 years later. A huge really. difference. I mean, the population has almost doubled. Um, <coughs> we've now got our own wonderful renewable energy system. Everybody's got a lease that needed one. Businesses, farms, and street farms um, operating. 
and there's any number. I think that's the, you know, we, we never wanted the trust to be the coverall for everything, but to enable people to do things for themselves. And there's been any number of small businesses started up um, over the years. Uh, we've now got an egg brewery. Uh, that's the, probably the most recent one. Uh, and we've also got Anne Lamerick that we, we built then, 98. <coughs> we've just done a huge project um, and doubled the size of it because we've got a bigger com um, population. We were getting twice the amount of visitors that we used to. And the businesses that were operating just had no space. You know, it was a, so, um, so yeah, it's an awful lot of hard work. There's no denying it. You'll know yourself, Agnes. Um, but God, is it worth it? I mean, really, when I think about it, you know, when you're in the midst of it, you don't think about it. You're just doing it day by day. And you think, oh, my God, how is this going to work? And oh, my God, how are we going to do this? But when you stop and think you know, and again, you realize just what a huge amount of work has been achieved, really. Um, Maybe it's time, it's enough, good time to, to come to yourself, Karine, um, because one of the things we wanted to do tonight was, as well as um, kind of look at the whole picture in a way, and one of the things that Simon absolutely got was that when you were talking about land, you weren't just talking about the ground that you walk on, you were talking about the land, the community, the people and the family, the environment, the culture of the place. So maybe just start with, with yourself, the first question really in a way, and, and let's see where that takes us is, I mean, you're a singer, you're a songwriter, and your songs are very thought provoking. So the, provo the provocation, I guess, of a, of a song that makes you sit and listen and get the story you describe situations and you make people think about situations and land figures a lot in some of the songs that you, in many of the songs that you write. And I just wonder if you might say a wee bit just for us about, you know, how you find yourself in that place. Oh, interesting. Um, I mean, I think a lot of it has to do with, like I'm really struck listening to the both of you when you talked about going to um, Loch Inver for the first time you were at Akele. And then this Guardian article gets written <laughs> after a weekend of music and crack. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And actually, that's pivotal to any community, isn't it? It's like the places you can gather and the crack that you can have. And music plays a big part in that. And I think in the, in the land reform music, like Egg, for example, as a musician getting into folk music in the 90s, mid-90s, late 90s, Egg was legend. You know, and you were a legend, like you are a legend. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, be because, it, because it was a haven for musicians and there was a wee bit of a, a kind of reciprocity there around the musicians were getting a welcome, but they were also offering something in terms of being able to gather yeah. and also actually being part of like raising awareness and raising funds and making space for these things. So I think music and has played a massive part historically in that way as well. And the whole tradition of the Cayley you know, is about, is about community connection, isn't it? So that's why I was drawn to this kind of music and writing is essentially that. And that's, and that's I guess that's why I want to tell those stories. It's, it's, it's much the same impetus maybe that, that drives the journalist to write a story. <laughs> um, is, is you want to get, get the underbelly of all these complex legal social processes, do you know what I mean? Um, and I think for me, like, especially like the tradition of folk music, there's such a long lineage. I mean, this is a hundred years of land reform, but actually it goes way back yeah. longer than that, doesn't it? And you've got amazing characters like Mary Vaughan and Oren, you know, in Gaelic culture and the whole, the whole relationship between song making and poetry and talking about land. Um, the whole history of folk song is the history of people's connection to place and land, yeah. really. Um, so I feel like I'm guddling in that pool. <laughs> um, when I'm but your role, writing. your role, I guess, whether, and, and I'm not suggesting that you kind of give yourself that role, but very much the, the role of the, the, the singer and the, and, the, and the storyteller is to make us think in a slightly different way. 
Yeah, I think that's true. And actually, you know, you know some of the things that have caught my eye have not necessarily been um, the communities that are... Well, they are, they are communities that were fighting for the integrity of their land. You know, in the past 15 years, a, a connection to the many and Balmedy community in Aberdeenshire around yeah. Trump golf development, for example. Mm. Um, you know, I've written several times about that and about the things that, um, that, get, that get missed about a place that people live in, the things that matter to people um, are, are, are often quite small things that don't make it into strategies and you know, economic development plans and all the rest of it. It's about where, you, where children play and the places where your ancestors are buried and where you go for a walk and do you know what I mean? And the, yeah. and the things that grow there, these are the things that matter to a lot of people. Um, and as a songwriter or a storyteller of any kind, because poets do this and writers do this and filmmakers do this as well, you get to tell that story of land on a bit, a bit more of an intimate level. Do you know what I mean? Like the, the mm. kind of small things that are overlooked, which are a lot to do with family. And I know you're stressing family a lot, but a lot of that stuff has very little value in the kind of social, political, economic decisions that we make. But actually, it's how we live our lives. So. And do you think, uh, Karine, do you think that, uh, you know, taking that as a topic, as the, as the kind of central topic, does that, in this world of the climate emergency, are people more ready to, to talk about that top as a topic? Are, do people have a greater awareness? Or are we really just needing to make people think more about these things all the time? I mean, yes, I think we are <laughs> needing yeah. to make, all of us need to be thinking about it more all the time. But I also think we're at a receptive time because, I mean, just the fact that loads of people haven't made it down here because of the two consecutive storms, do you know what I mean? So the story of vulnerability of land and the trains are all down because trees are on the track and land is slipping and sliding and all the infrastructure that gets us from A to B and allows us to be connected is vulnerable. So, all, so, the, so the stuff that's around individual communities wanting to have ownership and care of their land is, is also slotted into this bigger picture. And it feels like they're, they're totally inseparable. As in, if, if more communities had the, with the knowledge that communities have of their own place yeah, for sure. and of the land and how it responds to what's going on, if there were more ownership, we would be much more resilient and ready for what's coming. So they feel, they feel yeah, like so this they're, is, it's, it's they're, not a story that's they're finished. They're like parallel kind of yeah. stories that are going on, aren't they? Is this a good time to hear your first song that you've chosen for us tonight? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I know there's some folk um, listening in Noider. Yep. So I would give a wee shout out to Jackie and Ian and Davey. Yes. Some of the folk up there. Um, I wrote this song just last year with Julie Fowlis and Ingrid Henderson and Ian McFarlane. It was for a radio programme where we were going up to celebrate the fact that um, the Fords, the pub in Inveree, is now in community ownership. And, um, and that's a big deal, because in any community... Huge deal. You know, it's like the pub or the village hall or the, or, or the Kirk or whatever, the community centre is the place where people are getting together. So the, the ability to own your pub is no small <laughs> thing. So it's a wee song dedicated to the Fords, if that's yeah, all right, and it's, cool. it's got a chorus as well. <coughs> I don't know if a room of lawyers and land activists are up for a chorus. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a wee bit of it also um, in Gaelic. I'm not a Gaelic speaker, but I'll give it my best bash. Um, you'll, wish that, you'll wish that Julie Fowlis was here instead. It's called Here's a Health to Inveree. <laughs> Just goes like this, and then, and then maybe you could give it a wee shot. Yeah. Jog slant chadun, jog slant chadun, och yow mahun to the ocean. Jog slant chadun, jog slant chadun, jog slant chadun, jog slant chadun, bum Here's a health to. you catch on to a wee bit of it? I mean, maybe? Even if all you got was here's a health to Inveree, uh, they would actually hear you in Noider if you sang it loud enough. Jog slant, 
Trace for the soul and the ones who have gone before. Jog slanturun, jog slanturun, och yelmachern to the ocean. Jog slanturun, jog slanturun, jog slanturun, von Krieg. Here's a hell. songs of our mothers. Diolch slán tirún, diolch slán tirún, ach iawn lachúrn to the ocean. Diolch slán tirún, diolch slán tirún, diolch slán tirún, von crí. Here's a hell It's been a long road in, in all kinds of weather. It's been a long road in, we set sail together. It's been a long road in, in all kinds of weather. It's been a long road in, we'll drink here together. It's been a long road in, in all kinds of weather. It's been a long road Thank you so much, Karine. While Karine's getting her breath back, and can I come back to you? Maybe. I'm well, not going to ask you to sing. You're all right. <laughs> <laughs> but you've got right. a very musical family, so uh, I'm sure that you might be able to turn your hand to an accordion or something, given the oh opportunity. Right. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> oh. um, the Cayley uh, oh, was very Cayley. important to Simon. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I think it's fair to say. Oh, yes, he absolutely thought that that was an important time. That was as important as getting people round the table for the for the meeting. Oh yes. Oh, and definitely mixed the the, the bag of cherries <laughs> were quite <laughs> memorable. <laughs> and people, you and know, that was always you know, part of it. <coughs> it? Oh, oh yes, you know you always had to have that celebratory cherry at the, the buyers. And uh, uh, us and uh, in, uh, the Kulak Hotel in Loch Inver was is quite a nice, and it was so good to see all the community there. Um, uh, and of course, in egg, egg now, um, <laughs> a massive, massive achievement. And, and uh, they, they know how to Kaylee in <laughs> egg. You know, so they, they really do because. So the Guardian uh, didn't get it wrong, that. <laughs> <way>. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think, uh, you know, I had visions of uh, myself and Leslie Wood of Brian Alan McRae's socks, you know, <laughs> just, uh, yes, following the two chicken, me at just the ditch. And then, uh, if my memory serves me right, I think um, Simon and uh, Michael Foxley had a very good night. <laughs> <laughs> I think they, they, they if my memory, they, they, woke, <coughs> they woke up the next day on someone's lawn. Am I right? <laughs> 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 oh, no, the... 
in and then there was Dia and then Dia yes or traditionally uh, there was so, so many noises in Atrias and in oh my the, the list and I remember before he set off uh, for Dia um, him saying <laughs> as he was going through right that's my way to Lipris and the other Hebridean island. <laughs> 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 yeah, and I oh, think yeah. we can substitute a Hebridean island for land anyway. Oh, oh, well, yeah. so, yeah. exactly. uh, oh, well, that's it. Can we yeah. maybe pause uh, and just give ourselves and say to we break just now? And can I just see if there's anybody in the audience who'd like to say a few words? Um, add a couple of comments to what we've had before. Just put your hand up, please, so that I can see you. We have some microphones, so please don't start until we get a microphone. Come on now, don't be shy. Oh, I see a hand here. Ersh, and tell us who you are. So my name's Sharon King, and I've been going to Ed for a number of years now. I have a question for Maggie. So um, back in the day, Maggie, when the island only had about 60 people, um, and you, you foresaw this vision and you know, things pr pr progressed and now, I don't know, there's 110, 120 people on the island. Is it a wee bit unwieldy for what you've designed back in the day? You know, are you managing to kind of accommodate everyone's different visions of, of what egg means to them now? Because it's quite different than it was 20 years ago. It is, and um, there's a lot of new folk that have not, you know, weren't there for the buyout, but somehow, I mean, living on eggs not for the faint-hearted. You know, it's 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 as you've proved. <laughs> I would say that for Ma for Maggie to arrive here to be with us tonight, she set off yesterday morning at eight o'clock in the morning. Yeah. And finally got into her hotel room when half past twelve last night. I think <laughs> around. <laughs> <the> <laughs> oh dear. Anna and I just came from Lewis and we <laughs> came by jet propulsion. <laughs> <laughs> Helped by the wind. Yes. <laughs> Go on, Maggie. I think, um, yeah, I, I find it amazing. I mean, right this moment in time, we've got an incredible bunch of, in, in, well, everybody's young in my eyes, but a, a, a young bunch of folk who are really active and are contributing lots to the, to the overall thing. And, I, and, you know, I think there's always space for new ideas there's also there's always space for new folk i don't think i th you know i think a quote i heard that simon said at the 20th anniversary that buying egg was one in the eye for anyone mean-spirited or self-seeking mm -hmm. and i think that's you know if you arrive on egg and you are self-seeking you're not going to get very far <laughs> <laughs> so it you know and it's hard, to it's hard to express that, but I don't think there's any different vision going on, really. It's a case of loving egg, not, wa not wanting it to change. Obviously, wanting it to change, you know, we, we, need, we needed electric, for instance. We needed broadband, but n not to spoil it and to keep that kind of sense of the way of life that we've yeah. got there. Um, yeah, time doesn't stand still. No. We wouldn't want it to. No, but... But it's interesting just because there are so many new folk living there. The biggest problem we've got is building housing for them oh all. God, but we're, we're not, not, not going to start talking tonight. about housing. <laughs> oh, we'll never get out of that one. <laughs> Somebody else? Can I just see? Hands up if you want to say a few words. Here we have Fiona right here at the front. Can you say who you are, Fiona, although I've said you're Fiona? <laughs> <laughs> you gave the game away. Yeah. <laughs> so Fiona Morrison, um, I'm a Fura cat, so I stay in Grimsey in uh, Uist, um, but I'm also chair of Scottish Rural Action. But a number of years ago, I was involved in some research uh, because, of course, our islands, and Agnes, you will know this, the Outer Hebrides are projected to have the worst demographic decline going. And I have to say, in Uist, we didn't believe it. So we started doing sort of very much community-based uh, research um, around who the young returners were and, you know, why have they come back? And anyway, I can tell you about the detail of that later. So we challenged the big research organizations and then we worked with them 
And out of that, and, and they sort of recognized that we were picking up information that they indeed were not picking up. And that was really important, that those living in places know what's what. Mm -hmm. So, excuse me, <coughs> the, the outcome of that was the Islands Revival Declaration, where we had gathered stories from lots of islands, even in the Caribbean, but primarily around Scotland and some in Ireland, which were showing green shoots of recovery. And when we asked what the factors were around those green shoots of recovery, community land ownership was definitely one of the factors. Because I just wanted to say that, that it's part of a much bigger picture. And uh, I think you can track those trends. Mm -hmm. And we need young people. And if they feel they have control around where they live and they have the economic literacy of understanding what the opportunities are where they live, the world is their oyster. Here, here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Over here. Alistair McIntosh, can I just say something about Simon's parental background? Because both his parents were formidable characters. His mother, and I, I don't know if it was true or not, Anne, but the story was that she was a great poacher. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, the idea that you had a female poacher <laughs> making the landowner's sound, is that true or not? I suppose you could say, you know, I myself probably she, uh, was a criminal from a very young age. <laughs> well, the, 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 story, the story had great traction in the back of the school bus, I can, I can, I can tell you that. And it did much for feminism in the islands. <laughs> but, but the thing about Simon Fathers, uh, old Doc Fraser, as we called him, was a huge man, and Simon and I were in the same class as the Nicholson, and from time to time, Doc Fraser would be our science teacher. And I'm sitting beside somebody here who's from the British Geological Survey, <laughs> because I'll never forget Doc Fraser's lesson on how it is that in the Outer Hebrides, you've got these radiating basalt dikes, and they're all pointing in towards west of Scotland, and Alistair Fraser was particularly fond of Mull, and he said to us that what happened was that long ago there was a great volcano in Mull. And from deep in the earth, all that rich magma came up, which accounts for the fertile soils in many parts. But then the volcano subsided and the plug hardened and the volcano went dormant. But then once again in the tertiary period, it started pushing up the magma, and the magma, and you can imagine this huge man and us school kids listening, <laughs> and Alistair Fraser himself exploding like a <laughs> volcano. The magma was pushing and pushing and pushing, but the plug was holding it down, and so great cracks opened out across Scotland, radiating all the way to the Outer Hebrides. And the magma oozed up and gave us the basalt dikes that we find. And I've often thought, what a metaphor for land reform. <laughs> the deep fertility <laughs> coming up to make our rich soils. And then the heavy plug of landlordism <laughs> bearing down on us. But the story fractures out and comes up in our communities all over the place. That was Alistair Fraser. <laughs> There's got to be a song there, Karine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just blown away at it. Simon <laughs> Fraser and Alistair McIntosh were in class together. That says something. <laughs> <isn't it? laughs> yep. Amazing, amazing. <laughs> Can we check out anybody else before I come back to... Uh, I don't know who this... That's my Again, <laughs> say who you are. <laughs> yeah, hi. Uh, oh, it's you, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> Worker with Simon for 20 years, so I just really want to say a few words in recognition of this great man. 
Um, it's a real tribute tonight to the number of people who've turned out here. Absolute tribute. I first met Simon because I was trying to stop an ancient woodland being bought or given back to the estate uh, by the forces of evil that we have to live in amongst. <laughs> and uh, Russell Johnston told me that if sorry, SNH Michael, can you hold up? The <coughs> sorry, Mike, can you hold up the microphone, yeah, please? Sorry. Yeah. If the SNH sponsored it. Um, it could be bought by the Crofters. He said, but you'll need a really good lawyer. So I phoned Bill Ritchie, who'd just done Ascent, along with John McKenzie and the great Alan McRae. I said, so who do you have as a legal advice? He said, Simon, you get in touch with Simon. Simon understood from day one what, we're against, up, what we were up against. We were up against SNH, and Jim Hunt is here tonight. And he said to me at the time, it was the only time he got really angry in his life because the SNH board didn't think crofters could look after an ancient woodland. And along with a lot of other friends, we finally managed it. And that was the start of a very long relationship with Simon, which went on through Egg uh, and Noida and many other successful purchases. There was a human side to all of this, because we used to drop out, Simon and I, uh, to Malinganish. He was intensely proud of his family, not just his family, his extended family, nephews, nieces, very, very supportive. That was the, Anne was asked the question, that was the driving force in his life, his extended family. And I'd like to think that includes both my sons who are here tonight, because he was part of that extended, sorry, they were part of that extended family. So in Malinganish, <laughs> Alistair has made a comment about whether or not it was a poacher. One time we set a monofilament net, and he said to me, um, you know, Michael, this is a wildlife crime. What do you think they're going to do? <laughs> well, we're two crofters showing, show, showing my son's traditional crofting skills, how to set a net. The sad thing all <laughs> that happened was all we managed to catch was what he called a bugger fish. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I need to pay tribute to Simon seriously because, like Maggie, we were very heavily involved in egg, not just the... 92 abortive bid, but the early years that followed that to 97. And that was the party of the century, the 97 <laughs> party. <laughs> At one point, as I passed that hotel coming into Edinburgh tonight, uh, there was some lighter size. Uh, there was a rumor that Pavarotti uh, was going to buy the island, and I think it was 3,000 opera students were going to be there. So I think. Maggie described as exclusive deleted at the time. <laughs> <laughs> we all went for lunch to the um, to the big hotel. I can't remember its name. Big hotel at the west end of Princess Street. Simon said to me, "It's not going to happen. You're all a piece of nonsense. Enjoy your lunch." And until last year, it was the most expensive lunch I have ever had. <laughs> it started with quail's eggs and went on from that. Uh, he was a great, great man and did a formidable amount of work for the land reform movement. Noida was mentioned, um, the regional council for Noida. He did all the legal work for Noida, setting out over a long weekend, because he came around with my friend John Hutchison to talk about and have a dram afterwards. They had all the title deeds laid out on the table to pick up the t titles from the MacDonnell days all the way from the 16th century through to the current day to get it right because he always got it right. And a previous solicitor had tried and failed and sent a bill in. Simon did all that, there was no bill. And we got it done. Noida was bought, yet another successful part. He was an absolute, I have not met his like in Scotland as a lawyer in terms of being, the thing with Maruma, <laughs> weeks ahead of the international lawyers, and goodness knows what they were paid. He knew what was coming in, he knew what they were gonna say, he knew how to respond. Just quite formidable. My last thing for me was, sadly, about a month before he died, uh, he was dying because he, he, he suffered his illness extremely well for a long period of time. But anyway, the boys and I went out to um, uh, St. Louis, and he said, you may be better not come, I've got C. difficile. I said, no, that's fine, we'll be all right. We'll take, we'll take lots of whiskey, that'll be, that'll be all this. <laughs> anyway, we had, a, we had an afternoon tour of the west side of Lewis. And it wasn't just the big community buyouts. He was telling us without any boasting or pomposity, all the people locally that he had helped to get their house or their land or their legal problems sorted out. So we really, really miss Simon. And about once a week, I read something in the papers. I think, have I read that right? Who do I phone to give me the one word answer to say 
how wrong this is or that opinion is, that was the man. We won't see his likes again, but I'm hoping there's a generation coming through that will follow in his footsteps. Thank you very uh. much. Oh. Anne, can we just maybe spend a few minutes talking about Mullinganish? That was, oh, that was his private oh. haven, oh, you could yeah. feel to say, and, and your family's oh. haven. Oh, yes, Describe to us where it is. Well, um, it's a um, small deserted village uh, in Harris, in North Harris, and um, he absolutely loved it there. He uh, or acquired it uh, for quite a number of years ago, and uh, himself and a good friend of his, Alistair Coltart, from Athen, um, they renovated one of the cottages there, and uh, they, they, he absolutely loved you know going there he uh, we need to explain to people you can't drive there oh oh no no i can't so so so, so, so tell, tell these oh listening dear. people <laughs> <laughs> how you okay. get to malinka uh, yes um well you have to if you're going walking there you you walk for one and a half miles uphill and one and a half miles downhill so it has it quite a cardiovascular walk. <laughs> it's not for the faint hearted, you know. And, um, but you can get there uh, by boat, which quite often Simon did. Um, he used to actually leave his boat in Renegadale, uh, not too far away, a wee village, or, or go to Scalfi, to uh, the quay there at Kyle's Scalfi, and he would launch the boat there and just it would be just 15 20 minutes in the boat and uh, it was just so so enjoyable going there and I, i'm sure uh, a lot here uh, tonight you know know the place well and michael of course um knows it very well and callum rory duncan his sons um it's amazing simon it was his retreat he uh, it's also, there's no electricity there. He renovated the cottage, but um, there's a lovely wood burning stove there and um, lots of books because he loved to read, you know, and uh, he, he liked nothing better than sitting there with his friends, Mike, you know, the family, and uh, uh, you know, beside that lovely warm stove and, and a dram or two, that, that was his idea of relaxation. And there was no phones, no, Tel no um, telegraph poles. You, you looking at the window uh, from that little cottage, you wouldn't really know what generation you were living in because there are no telegraph poles and everything. It would be odd sheep. So <laughs> it, it was just <laughs> lovely. Uh, and of course, his cousins, and especially his dear cousin Seamus, uh, really loves going there. Um, and of course, he, he took his nieces and nephews and who was very close to, and um, their friends. They just adored being there, and I think Simon was just such a role model um, to these uh, young folk. And of course, he was a, a really good cook as well, and he used to make them these lovely banquets in, in um, Mullinganish. So at New Year, they would have this um, big feast in the New Year. And, uh, and, and, you know, they miss that. And of course, this is the thing, it's an, you know, we really miss he, 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 his wise counsel. As Michael said, you know, he, he just seemed to have the answer to um, any problem he had. Um, so he would find the answer. He would, he, he would find the answer, yes, indeed. So uh, as I say, Molly English uh, was um, definitely um, a big place for him. Um, place to go to. A big place to go to. Yeah. Oh, yes. And even in his busy uh, workload. And of course, along with uh, his work with the buyouts, and he had his general legal work in the office uh, to do as well. But even in the office, uh, my, my sister, Sini, who's a, a paralegal there, and her colleagues um, just remember it as being a very happy um, place to work in. And the staff, they seemed to, to be there a long time, because a few of them had their um, 
50th anniversary, we're in our 50th uh, anniversary. So um, I think uh, they like a good banter in the office between, you know, it's uh, happy, humorous, and wish Simon had this, you know, sharp wit. So it, uh, they, they all tell me that it was just such a, a good working environment to be uh, working in. And he, obviously before he passed away, he had the foresight to recruit two very able solicitors, Maggie Mackay from Mills and Isabel MacLeod, who's with us here tonight. And they uh, obviously started in the business to, to help him run the business and of course his partner, uh, Duncan Bird, ran the Sky office. Uh, so really, I feel too that um, Probably Simon, although, although he had this busy life, he always made time for his family, um, which was so important to him. And during the last few years, he, one of his greatest pleasures was becoming a grandfather um, to two lovely girls. And now we have a total of, well, at the last count, seven <laughs> grandchildren. <laughs> so it's so he, uh, he would he love that if he was here. Oh, <laughs> yes, indeed. You know, he, he, was, um, he, he adored them. Uh, but Maybe um, just yeah. check once more. Uh, I've, there's, there's a lot of people in here. Um, anybody else with, with a, a memory they'd like to share or a, a question they'd like to ask? Here we are here. Just wait and we'll get the microphone. No, because this, this helps the, those listening at oh home. Right. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Vickers, my name. Um, I knew Simon as a neighbour in the parish. Um, I, I've been going there for, God, since I was three. Um, and <coughs> met Simon after I got married to Anne. Um, I didn't realise just how great he was. <laughs> <laughs> as a neighbour, <laughs> although latterly I, I did become aware of that. But I think what I want to say about Simon is the sort of guy he was. <coughs> um, I, when I was going there, my, I had an old auntie, my uncle died 50 odd years ago, and an old auntie who lived next door to Anne and her sister. Um, she stayed in that house, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> till she was 102. Um, and very much because of Simon and Anne and her sister. And I think what I want to say is that not only was he a great man looking out for other people, but in his own community, quite simply, he was a man of humility. He, he, he valued community. He valued the people around about him. I used to come on a holiday every year and he would spot me and he'd go, I'm, I'm getting the bottle in tomorrow, Angus, come over. <laughs> uh, he, he, now, Simon wasn't a man who didn't like whiskey, but he wasn't particularly fond of malt whiskey, and he knew I had a particular penchant for Aberlour. So he'd get himself to Stornoway and, and get, me, get me a bottle of Aberlour. I think that is the measure of the man. <coughs> that quite simply, he was great looking out, but he also was great for the people around about him as well. <coughs> Thank, Thank you. you very much. Oh, yeah. And I think you had uh, a piece that uh, oh. Carl McLeod that you mentioned earlier oh. that you wanted to read out before we oh. we close. Oh yes, um, I was just going to uh, just read a few uh, words. That it's from an article uh, that Carl and Ian McLeod, who worked with Simon at the Cavanish uh, Centre Trust all these years ago, that later became a key church minister. And uh, obviously this was an article written in our local historical uh, society magazine uh, after Simon passed away. So I'll just read the paragraph to you. I hope it doesn't sound too much like a sermon, but I'll just read it. So it's not too long. It reads, he, he wrote, the apostle Paul, as he brings his first letter to the church at Corinth to a conclusion, refers to specific individuals who were committed, dedicated, reliable, and self-effacing servants who had the best interests of the church community at heart. Paul says, they have been a wonderful encouragement to me 
as they have been to you too. Such men deserve recognition. Such was Simon, a son of encouragement and a tremendous support to many here. A self-effacing giant of a gentleman with a servant's heart. He understood more than most, perhaps, that it is better to give than to receive. It is only fitting that we too should recognize Simon for who he was and all he so generously gave to so many over past years. Thank you. That's yeah. lovely. Thank you. That's lovely. Maggie, would you like to say a couple of oh. just I've final just, words from Egg? I've, I've just, I just thought of something Sam had told me one day when, um, when he was ill and he'd been in hospital. And uh, obviously a lot of people, were, he must have been in Ragmore at that point, and a lot of people were coming to visit him. And he said, it was just like Parkinson, Parkinson in Gaelic. <laughs> 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 Michael. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, oh, I don't know what else. I mean, everything's been said about Simon. He was an amazing mm. character. Um, and he undoubtedly, you know, had a huge effect on Egg, as Noida and Gear and all the rest. But I think, you know, he, he became a good friend. I mean, that's, yeah. you know, that's normally not what, mm -hmm. it's normally not what you do with lawyers, really. Yeah, sorry, that, that, that's, that's I'm it. sorry if there are any more lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> She doesn't really mean it. <laughs> <laughs> but he just, he, g he gave of his time so freely. Um, and it was just, it was the love of, of everything we've talked about, the, the land, the people, the history of the music. You know, it's the whole thing combined together. Um, and oh, yeah, what else can you say? <laughs> Thanks, Maggie. Karin. I mean, um, I think it's very appropriate that we pull this together with a song. Sure. And uh, I'll let you introduce yeah. what you're going to give us. I mean, I'd love to make what, just one wee reflection, because I, I never sure. met Simon. Um, so I'm, I've learned a lot, loads about Simon tonight. Um, and I'm really moved by the, it's what you said there about the, not just the outward impact, but the, you know, that is totally, the effectiveness of the outward impact is totally connected mm -hmm. to, the, uh, to the importance of family and place and value on retreat and rest and neighborliness and conviviality and all those things. They're kindness. Not kindness and generosity. They're not like happenstance things. Like the outward effectiveness depends upon having all that, like that network of support around you and valuing all that stuff. And it's something it feels to me really important right now for anybody that's involved in any kind of social change or environmental change or anything because so much of the narrative around being a being a fighter <laughs> for change is about sacrifice and pain and giving all those things up you know not resting and everything being you know your family having to take a back seat and and actually it's a really beautiful story of how actually the two things go hand in hand with each other and maybe that's a wee thing that's the thing I, I'll take away anyway. Oh. Yeah. Brilliant. I think it's beautiful. Lovely. Um, you sang very beautifully, so you get another wee chance. <laughs> um, I know there's lots. Of, I know this is a very knowledgeable room, and all the people out there watching very knowledgeable about land reform and about and some frustrations about holdups in the current process in Scotland um, around how quickly that's moving. Um, but worth worth noting um, that things are, are much more difficult south of the border and actually it, it, for many folk that are in, uh, working in an English legal capacity they're looking to Scotland as a in a hopeful <laughs> in a hopeful capacity so this is a song I wrote for a group of campaigners connected to Dartmoor around all the stuff that's happening there around the right to wild camp which is which is kind of emblematic of the whole lack of land access in England and it's a thing I notice all the time when I'm touring um, out and about and seeing no, no, no trespassing private property signs that they're not mucking about um, those signs and it's such a different feeling um, when you're out and about having a walk. So this is a wee nod to them 
um, and it's got another wee chorus if you fancy it. Um, the campaign is called The Stars Are Ours UK um, and I wish them all well with their legal campaigning. So the chorus goes like this. The stars, the stars, the stars will not be sold for the stars. The stars, the stars, the stars will not be sold for the stars. Thank you so much, Corrine. You're and welcome. That was, that was just lovely. Yeah. Got, me, got me here. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry to say, folks, that brings this Simon Fraser inaugural lecture to a close. Thank you to everyone who's come here tonight. Through wind and rain mm -hmm. and boats and trains. No, not many trains, actually, no trains. as it turned out. <laughs> um, <laughs> by road, um, and so on. Thank you to everyone who's joined us at home. Thank goodness for modern technology that allows us to do this and, and do it in a really meaningful kind of way. Um, it's just fantastic. It's testimony, I think, to your interest in joining us here tonight that you have an interest in community-owned land and in the land 
and in the communities who live on these lands. And I think for those of you who knew Simon, it's testament to the fact that you wanted to be here, here tonight or joining us online tonight to show your appreciation for this man who meant so much to us and who has left such a huge legacy, some of which we've just touched on here tonight. Thanks again to our sponsors mentioned by Ailsa before. Without your support, we wouldn't have been able to do this fantastic event. And we look forward now to the rest of the event that will happen in the course of this year. And I hope some of you at least will be able to join us here and there. Um, I hope for those of you who maybe came here tonight not knowing very much about what community owned land might be about, what could it mean to you, that maybe it's just kind of opened your eyes a wee bit, it's kindled your interest. If it has, visit your nearest community owned trust, get in touch with them, go on to our website, Community Land Scotland, there are lots of ways of doing it. It might not be for you, but then again, who knows, it might be. And if you'd like to continue the chat tonight, I believe that at least a few of them, us maybe, who knows, I'm looking forward to it, are gathering in, and I'll probably get this wrong, the Kilda Kin, Josh, whoa, yes. good God. <laughs> How could it be so hard? Anyway, um, finally, a very special thanks to Karine Powart, to Maggie Fife, and Anne Fraser, who made this such a really special night. Time to go home, <laughs> or to the pub, or wherever you want to go. <laughs> <laughs>